Okay, I compliment Bill on his mastery of the, of the issue. Um, I think he's made my job very much easier. And I'm standing in for Tom Morrison, whose family uh, circumstances are such he hasn't uh, been able to prepare. So I apologize for not being Tom Morrison for those who think they came to hear him. And I'm sure most of you did. Um, <clears throat> anyway, should the working class uh, support Scottish independence? Well, the short answer is no. Um, I'm sure Gallagher would have said no, as he did in the 1930s, and campaigned for home rule. That's Gallagher up there. And so did Magaki in the 1970s, and campaigned for a home rule Scottish Parliament. And so did Keir Hardy in the 1890s, and did James Connolly, who was a member of the same party. They campaigned for home rule, not for independence, but to maintain the unity of the British working class. Um, now, none, I think, of those figures, none of the key figures in our movement would have supported white paper independence because it is just what Connolly warned about and Bill's spoken already. You change the flag over Dublin Castle from the Union Jack to a green flag, does it change anything? No, it doesn't, unless you've changed the property relations and the white paper will preserve the property relations, as Bill has very well laid out. The white paper independence is a trap. But I want to start by the arguments for independence as put forward on the left. We've heard a lot about them over the last couple or three or four weeks in the Star. We've also heard them at a number of public meetings. Let's look at these arguments. They start off by saying, I think, they don't agree with everything in the white paper, but they agree with its general tone. <clears throat> its general tone is social democratic. The key thing about the white paper independence is that it supplies a new start, a new start for the Scottish nation. The SNP won't necessarily be the government. There will be a constitutional convention set up to fix the new constitution. It will op offer the opportunities of mobilisation for the left, and, as Bill Berner said on Sunday, everything then will be up for grabs in creating a new Scotland, moulded in a socialist way. They'd also say that Scottish people, and that was what the SNP representative on the People's Assembly launch said, Tam was there, that Scottish people are innately more progressive than others. I think he said it was in their DNA to be so. So you better be rather careful about things uh, so on. I actually, my, I've only got a Scottish grandmother, so... Um, well, my father's I'm, Scottish. Yeah, well, well, is everybody here definitely um, in the DNA, are they? In fact, there was a, uh, there was a, a rather horrible um, misprint in the report of Sunday's Star Conference. Anybody noticed it, did they? Yes. Uh, the speaker from the... Racial Independence Coalition. <laughs> the Radical Independence Coalition. Anyway, that is one thing. That's the other belief that the Scottish people are progressive more than any other. And what would you achieve? You get rid of Trident, you get rid of the Tories, all the things that Bill's talked about, the bedroom tax, ATOS, privatisation. You can set up an oil fund, you can use the monies to rebuild industry and rebuild social services and the infrastructure. And the Scots will vote in the elections for a new green and socialist future. And there will be a beacon to the world. Everybody would envy us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the perspective. I don't think I've missed anything out, have I? Maybe maybe I have. But I don't so think so. Well, I have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't mention that. At the same time, one of their most powerful arguments are the negative <clears throat> ones. That it's futile to think of anything progressive coming out of England. That the Labour Party is irretrievably compromised now. It can never do anything progressive. The trade unions are no longer able to take any initiatives against uh, uh, bosses and also a majority or at least a great number of English people are pro-UKIP. So it is a reactionary place. And that is a very powerful negative argument as well. So those, I think, are the arguments that take people forward. It is the belief. Somehow we can jump a Grand Canyon into a future that will be quite different after our whole series of failures by the left, or at least 
the left that constitutes the radical independence coalition. Well, I think Bill's put the arguments on the other side very, very clearly and coherently. The white paper is not in the slightest a progressive document. It's neoliberal in pastel shades, but it's neoliberal. Economic growth, what's the mechanism? You cut the taxes on big business. That's what the mechanism is, cut taxes on high earners. Membership of the European Union will underpin Scotland's economy. Not a whisper in that white paper about its neoliberal character or about interoperability with NATO in terms of armed forces. Well, you're going to be a member of NATO anyway. Economic democracy, well, it does talk about partnership and workers' councils, but on the same terms as the EU does. Not trade union reps, but workers elected by the company or through the company and you'll have two or three on the board prisoners that's what they're talking about partnership but not a word about scrapping anti-trade union laws you would think that would be in that white paper but I looked very hard and couldn't find it maybe Stephen Lowe who's got even better eyes for white papers than I have has found it I don't know have you found it Mark? Strangely no. no I don't know where it is maybe it's on printed on the back cover I didn't look there <laughs> Membership of the Stirling area. It's just done in a mechanical way, but there's not a word about the implications for public spending, which are massive, along with those from the EU. And why do it, does it have that character, what Bill said? Because these are the minimum conditions required by those who control the Scottish economy. And it's just useful. Bill said a bit about this, but say a little bit more. Who are they? Well, you've got a massive financial sector in Scotland. It's the big, fifth biggest financial se centre in Edinburgh in Europe. Massive. You've got two big banks, and together their assets are something like 400% of the GDP of Scotland. Rather like the relationship between the Icelandic banks before they all went bust and Iceland's economy. Roughly at that level. You've got two massive fund managers. Standard Life and Aberdeen Asset Management, two of the biggest in Europe. All these are ultimately controlled from London and the United States, if you look at the shareholdings within them. They all depend on the City of London and its regulation. Then you've got a host of smaller investment trusts and hedge funds, and that's where the uh, SMP's banking supporters hang out. But they need the big banks, because what do hedge funds and uh, investment trusts do? They lever. And to lever, you've got to get money from somewhere. Where do you get it from? You get it from the deposit banks and you get it from the other banking institutions. So you've got to have them around in Edinburgh for these operations to work. So that is why uh, you have to have the guarantees of sterling, the guarantees of sterling and City of London regulation or non regulation for the Edinburgh financial centre sector. So that's finance, absolutely crucially important, underpinning everything that Salmon does. And remember that Salmon, his professional occupation was an economist for um, uh, one of the RBS. banks, yes. RBS, yeah. uh, working in the oil sector with the corporate uh, managers there. And then if you look at the corporate sector, um, at the ownership, um, the Scottish owned sector, or Scottish registered sector, should I say, is 24%. That's the, all the big firms with more than 24, 25, sorry, 250 um, employees. So all the big ones are owned outside, uh, including all the retail, virtually in the entire retail sector, including Morrison's, although I think Tom does own quite a big slab of shares in the Morrison's <laughs> company. Um, but they're all owned from outside. And even when you go to the Scottish registered companies, the 24%, you look at the shareholdings, they're also from the fund managers from the City of London mm. and the United States. Go to manufacturing, and the Scottish registered companies are 14%. All the rest are owned from outside. So that's what Bill was talking about. Those are the figures. That level of external control over the economy. That's what Connolly talked about when he said, <laughs> If the property remains in the hands of others, 
and in the hands of a small minority, you will not have real independence. So, uh, how far will the yes vote leave everything up for grabs? Is that conceivable, which is the kind of final argument? Well, Independence Day will be on March 16th, I think the first, maybe. Not the first of April, but probably the first of March, 2016. Uh, the elections for the new Scottish Parliament will be on in May 2016. And then there will be a constitutional convention organised by the Scottish Parliament to produce a written constitution, with the Parliament having, in terms of the elective representatives of the Scottish people, the final say. So the two obvious questions we have to ask, how powerful will the socialist left be in 2016? How far will they be represented in that Scottish par Parliament? And secondly, and the question has already been posed by Bill, how far will that constitution have to incorporate the terms of the 2012 Stability Treaty? Now the first question is a more difficult one, the second one is rather easy to answer. But the first question is about class consciousness and national consciousness, and it's a fundamental one. It's how things change, because national consciousness is not something that is fixed and there forever. It is something that is moulded by social forces, moulded, in fact, by class struggle, moulded, as Lenin said, by the level of class struggle. There are always different trends within any national consciousness. You will have a feudal one, necessarily, in some countries. You will certainly have a dominant capitalist one, and you will have a democratic one, depending on the strength of the working class struggle, and you will have a working class culture as well. All those trends will exist, but it will depend on the level of struggle, how strong they are. And traditionally, in Scotland, they have not necessarily been stronger than in England. There were two Labour MPs, I think, in 2006, but there were something like 50 from England and Wales. Keir Hardy had to leave Scotland to get elected as an MP because the left was so weak at that time in Scotland. There were other factors in terms of the actual electoral system and um, the, the, the way in which the Liberal Party operated in Scotland that also had an effect. But there was a significant weakness of the left at that time. Um, and we have seen, over the last two centuries of Scottish history, periods in which there have been transformations in working class consciousness in Scotland. The first one was way back in the 1810s, 20s and 30s and it was around the development of the movement for democracy. But it was one that was waged in unity with that in England and Wales against a British state. In that struggle, because the army went out and was used and shot people down and people in thousands were imprisoned, they saw the operations of a British state. And not just that, they saw their own ruling class. Their own ruling class, as Bill said, in place, the ones who owned the assets, the property in Scotland. They were the ones who commanded the militia regiments. Those are the ones who gave the orders to fire when they uh, fired on people during uh, 1842 or 1839. Those are the ones who uh, were the oppressors because they own Scotland and they haven't gone away. When I mentioned the, the, the hedge funds uh, and the other Edinburgh assets, uh, that is where these people are now. They've all gone out of uh, manufacturing industry but they're still in the finance sector and that's where they operate. That's where the money is to be made now. Well, some have gone down to London like the Camerons and others and uh, operate down there but they're still around. And for the whole period of the 19th and 20th century, their modus operandi, the way in which they worked, was to assume that in order to get their profits in Scotland, they had to have a wage differential against England. And therefore you had a much harsher line in legal terms, in terms of the application of the law in the workplaces against trade unions, 
than you did in Scotland. That's why, in fact, the trade union movement was weaker in Scotland. In the Lanarkshire Coalfield, there were no unions at all between about 1856 and 1890. No unions at all. They'd been destroyed by the employers, by lockouts, by people being driven away, by hunger, by people being evicted. That was the Scottish employers. And that joint battle with the English and the Welsh was what created the basis for class consciousness, the basis for people like Keir Hardy. The second great period of change was during the First World War up to 1926. Again, a joint struggle with the English. We should remember that the pinnacle of that struggle, 1919, was one in which you had a strike in Glasgow and across the whole of the central industrial belt and into the mining areas in Scotland. But it was won, and it was in a qualified way won, because the government had to concede uh, insurance, cheap insurance against Bolshevism, as Lloyd George gave it, in terms of provision for health and housing in February 1919. It was won because the workers in South Wales and in Coventry and above all in London came out. The transport system was paralysed and the workers, when they were actually drafting the various concessions in the King's speech, the workers in London were threatening to pull the plugs on the electricity system. And we should remember that there was, at the same time as they were organising hands-off Russia demonstrations in London, they organised, after the George Square riots, they organised, and it was Sylvia Pankhurst who was the leading speaker, hands-off Glasgow demonstrations attended, well, in the Albert Hall, attended by 4,000 people. So it was that joint struggle. And for those who remember it in the 1970s, most vividly, you had struggles in Scotland, but they interlinked with and built with the struggles in London, in the Dockers, the struggles in the coal fields, with Saltley Gates, and without that interlinkage, you wouldn't have got the transformation of consciousness that took place in the 1970s and gave the impetus, in fact, for a Home Rule Parliament, one that we were denied in 1978-79, partly by the voting of the SNP in London uh, in terms of bringing down uh, the Labour government, but nonetheless uh, that was what was the momentum for that. So national consciousness changes in terms of class struggle and it can change for the better in terms of class and for the worse. And we have to think what will happen between 2014 and 2016. Two things will happen. You will have rancorous, if there's a yes vote, negotiations with the British government about the national debt, rancorous negotiations about sterling, rancorous negotiations about trade relations, rancorous negotiations about the division of the North Sea assets, in which it will be Mr Salmon standing up as a nationalist leader who will be defending the interests of the Scottish people. And some people, uh, I think it was on Sunday, somebody got up and said that Salmon was really a Republican socialist under the skin. He also previously had said uh, Keir Hardy was in favour of independence, so I think probably his historical knowledge is a little bit limited. S Mr Salmon is not prime E, maybe a social democrat in a kind of a way, but he is principally, essentially, a nationalist. And he will see himself and his party wanting to move forward to be the leading party in an independent Scotland. And he will use that negotiation to be able to build himself up as the Scottish de Valera, or whatever model that he uh, sees ahead of himself. That's what he will do. And that process will change consciousness itself. And the other thing that will happen, almost certainly, because of the economic circumstances, and they will not be good because the oil revenue is declining. Uh, all the figures that the SNP have put out are not factual. The oil revenues uh, are something like uh, this year um, just past uh, a third lower than what they were the previous year. There will be an 8% deficit. Well, all the stuff in the EU document says 3% is the maximum deficit. And if you look at the Stability Treaty, it's 0.5%. So 
the money markets and the EU will be saying, well, you've got to cut things. And there will be calls for stability. In fact, I even noticed that Colin Fox in one of his uh, articles said that immediately after the independence referendum, we'll need to have stability. So we can have, probably have Mr. Salmon and Mr. Fox standing there and say, we need stability. Don't rock the boat. Well, we've got this, we've got the concept, we've got the white paper, we better put it through, otherwise the markets will do us in. We've got to do this. And we just need to think, what is the current level of support for the socialist left in Scotland electorally? It is very, very, very small. Um, those of us who've taken part in by-elections recently know just how small it is. They know just how small our vote is as well, unfortunately. <laughs> But at least in government we did beat Chip Tommy Sheridan. Um, <laughs> we got 35, he got 29. But how on earth he's going to overcome uh, uh, a Labour 2000 and SNP 1000? I don't know in electoral terms and jump to the top again. But anyway, so that's that's the way in which things are likely to change between 2014 and 2000. And 16. On the one hand, uh, a weakening of class consciousness, a growth of nationalism, and on the other, pressures for stability. And in those circumstances, I can see no way in which that tr treaty of stability will not go into the Constitution as they're trying to negotiate their way into Europe. It will go in. And, of course, it will go in because even the socialist left is confused and divided on the issue of the EU. There's no firm position in their ranks. So how on earth they think that that can be changed, I don't know. So that will be, I think, the outcome. It's a trap. And then it will get worse, because once they're in that trap and austerity will be imposed by the EU, remember what it does to small nations who have big, big deficits. Look at Cyprus, look at... Portugal, look at Croatia, immediately joined, it was told it had to cut its budget by about 30%. It joined last year, it's being cut this year. What will happen to Scotland with an 8% deficit? But who will be blamed? Undoubtedly, Mr. Salmon will say it's the English, it's the terms on which things have been divided. It's the fact that Britain didn't get, uh, Scotland didn't get all its oil money. And all the press, just think of the press in Scotland, it's all owned from outside all controlled from outside, I think. Everything is controlled from outside, apart from, is the Beano still produced in Dundee? <laughs> it is, yeah. Well. <laughs> but what line the Beano would take, I'm not quite sure. The Thompson, Thompson newspapers are um, notoriously anti-union. I can't see them, them rocking the boat. So, that is the reality of it. It is, as far as I can see, pie in the sky to believe that white pen paper independence would take us forward. It would divide the working class, as Bill said, and make it infinitely more difficult to mobilise against state power and ownership concentrated at the level of the British state. Infinitely more difficult. As soon as um, you had independence, if you're going to get it, um, after the elections that will take place uh, in Britain in, 19, in 2015, there will be elections, Quite probably you'll get a Labour government elected, the kind we'll wait and see. It will do certain things, it would abolish the bedroom tax. But March the 1st, all the Scottish MPs would, would withdraw. And the Labour government would fall, almost certainly. These are things that I'm afraid the, the so-called uh, radical independents don't think about. So, the issue is how we're going to get a no vote, not a no vote, but a progressive no vote. Mm. It depends on two things above all. One is the credibility, as Bill said, of a left-wing fight back across Britain, and above all, I think the vehicle is the People's Assembly, with its all-British um, steering committee at the top. And secondly, projecting a progressive alternative in Scotland, taking the position of the red paper, that our party has played a very big role in developing and promoting, but so have our comrades on the left of the Labour Party and some not in any party. It is there. It puts that radical alternative. 
and it is a matter of taking radical federalism seriously. And there are two elements to it. One is redistribution. It is having a structure at British level that can redistribute income in two ways. One is to areas of social need, and so you have the distribution of income in terms of the demographic needs, in terms of poverty and unemployment in Scotland and Wales and English regions. But also, to make that feasible and possible, mm. social redistribution of income to ensure we're not just on the existing system of redistribution, but there is more redistributed from the rich to the poor. And secondly, at the level of Home Rule Parliaments, there is the power to own and control, own and control industry. That there is an ability to develop the power of working people over capital, progressively, so that achievements in one nation can strengthen achievements of workers in another, in an upward spiral, not the downward spiral that the uh, SNP would do in terms of undercutting tax rates. Those are the two key elements in radical federalism. And it is quite different from the perspective of devolution that is being put forward, unfortunately, by the Better Together campaign and by various people on the right wing of the Labour Party when they talk about devolution max. They think the only way of meeting the SNP is to say, oh well, we will devolve everything. All income tax will be done in Scotland, and therefore, well, the Scots can tax themselves and pay for everything. But what does that do? It is a neoliberal principle which stops redistribution. That's why radical federalism is what we must pursue. Now, it's not going to be easy. In a sense, it's going to be the most difficult thing to do um, to be able to push this forward uh, immediately, to mobilize the trade union and labor movement in, in, uh, in Britain of this struggle. Mm. And that is why uh, it is so important that the English trade union and labour movement and the trade union and labour movement in Wales takes up this issue now of radical federalism and makes it seem real rather than just something that's being talked about by some people on the left in some trade unions in Scotland. Mm. So I think that's probably, uh, there was a lot of answers, questions put thrown at us by Bill, but I, I'm not going to answer them. They're too difficult for me, I think, to answer, but I'm sure the audience will be, the comrades assembled here will be able to answer them. Um, the red paper position is about class politics. It's about changing national consciousness in Scotland, but also in England and Wales. And that's the essence of it, is to understand national consciousness can become progressive, it can become reactionary. The motive force for change is class politics. Yeah, I thought both speakers make an excellent, an excellent argument against the independence as set by the SNP. Uh, I've heard both sides of the debate now and I think that it boils down to whether you're serious about building it a working class movement which can challenge the power of capital or whether you want to believe in fairy tales. So uh, I suppose we'll open up to questions.